Okay, um, I think I'm going to have to manage expectation a little bit here because, uh, you know, the original aspiration, SOM were involved in this project four or five years ago. Uh, it was the result of uh, competition, uh, which clearly we won. Um, and the original aspiration was to um, find a developer proposal that would end up with a building as a net zero energy building. And what we mean by that is really the building would actually be a net contrib contributor in terms of energy back, back to the grid or, or back to the system. Really the discussion tonight is, or this afternoon, is, is really just trying to introduce you A to the building and the kind of context by which we were trying to realize some of these ideas. We had a number of strategies, maybe 30, 40 strategies, not all of them survived. And really, that's an important context in terms of what we've been discussing over the last two years. I mean, we've seen some amazing proposals over not least the last presentation uh, over the last two days. And, you know, there's a kind of great temptation to try and, you know, put a lot into your building to try and make it sustainable and a number of strategies. And some of the strategies that even that we're employing on the building are probably not ones that you would do if you were looking for the payback. We've had several different... Um, contributors so far, developers and whatever, and uh, Steve Watts yesterday was uh, fairly derogatory about wind turbines in the building. Well, I'm going to show you some. Well, I'm not going to show you on the building because they're not quite in yet, but uh, you know, there's a number of strategies that have survived the process, which I'll take you through. And it, it's, really, it's really a combination of um, the kind of passive and active measures, uh, because really one of the inspirations that kind of drove the, the first ideas of the building was really how can we harness wind, how can we harness solar power, and how can we harness geothermal. And because these are all energy sources that actually come for free, or they're out there, and they're happening potentially 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the building's not always occupied uh, during those, those periods, and particularly in this case, because it's 2.2 million square feet of commercial office building. So... Um, I think with that we'll kind of begin. I've, I've got a couple of Al Gore slides which I'll uh, kind of skip through because I guess you've seen most of them before. But um, really, we, I started to kind of describe the net zero energy. This is a net zero energy building. It's not relying on very much at all. It's providing shelter. So this is a net positive energy. And there's a kind of serious point here. And th this is really the kind of conceptual idea behind Pearl River Tower is that how can we actually build a building which was clearly in a, in a Class A commercial office building in China is going to consume a fair amount of energy. It's a high performing and high expectations in terms of tenancy kind of expectations. So it's not that it's not consuming any energy, but uh, how can we actually start to think about buildings in both their form and, and their function and also all the other necessary strategies that go into a a uh, uh, 2.2 million square feet commercial building. The other thing is that as architects and engineers, we've kind of complicated things over the last hundred or so years. We've uh, had a couple of people that are kind of responsible for that, both good and bad, uh, with Mr. Otis uh, providing us with the elevator or the lift, as we say in the UK, so just in case there's a few Brits left. Um, and also kind of um, the introduction of electricity uh, into buildings is... And we touched upon this, I think, in the earlier session about uh, the amount of electricity that buildings actually consume. So we've got to really develop strategies to kind of mitigate some of this consumption. And then equally, we all kind of rely uh, in a Chicago summer and elsewhere around the world on the contribution by carrier, really, in terms of keeping buildings uh, to a comfort level that we, we appreciate. Unfortunately, all these things together you potentially end up with a, you know, a high energy, high energy consuming building. So, you know, we have all these things in the building, um, but really the whole idea behind Pearl River was to see what other ways we could, some new ways maybe, in terms of some of the passive measures and, and take advantage of current technology. I don't think there's really anything that we're putting in the building that hasn't been done somewhere else, but they haven't necessarily been put together in a high-rise context, so that, that's what made this building a bit of a challenge. Um, these are the Al Gore ones that I'm going to skip through quite, 
quickly because we've already touched upon this, but it, it is worth noting again, and you know, that 1% that Adrian was talking about, the new building stock and the 99% the of existing building stocks, you know, 40% of that electricity consumption globally that we all use is in that building stock. Now, those of you who are familiar with China um, will know that it it's actually can be quite an unpleasant environment to live and work in. And, uh, you know, in a way, uh, that's only going to get worse because in China in the near future, and I don't like to be too much of a pessimist, but uh, I, I, I put this in because where the red line and the green line actually cross, that means there'll be as many people in China in the urban areas as there are in the rural areas. And I think Carol was kind of alluding to this earlier on um, about the kind of mass migration that's going on in the, not just China, but elsewhere around the world. Uh, you know, it has all sorts of implications, not least, you know, it's a fact that the city dweller um, consumes two and a half times more energy than their rural counterpart. So, you know, we're, you know there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue there in terms of energy consumption. It also means that in terms of the loss of that agricultural workforce, going to the cities to try and carve out a living, there's less people growing and producing food. Now, I put this slide in, and 10 or 15 years ago, uh, a lot of the red would have been over North America. And this is really just a slide to show you that China and the construction boom that's currently going on there is actually also the manu manufacturing center of the world. And uh, as a consequence, it kind of rather suffers from its carbon emissions. China is also in the process of commissioning 400 new coal-fired power stations over the next 10 years. That's one every nine days, so that's something else to bear in mind. And also, and we are very thankful for this because currently, SOM in Chicago at least, uh, most of our active work, and I'm sure it's the same for most of you out there, is still in China. So. Uh, and that's another phenomenal kind of statement, really, that 50% of all new construction is actually happening in China. So, you know, we've got some lessons to learn of how we're going to commission and, and build and design and live in buildings in China, but also there's going to be repercussions worldwide, really. In the, in the design of Pearl River, it's really one of the guiding kind of principles we gave ourselves is that form in itself is not really a good enough factor in determining building shape. So it has to be more than that. It has to be performance-based. And, you know, there's some other industries that actually look at this stuff in terms of the car manufacturing and also the aviation industry that are, spend a lot of time and effort um, looking at their product, for want of a better word, word, to make them more energy efficient, whether that be for fuel consumption in a car or you know, uh, less aviation fuel if it's an aircraft. So perhaps we should be transferring some of this technology and, and innovation in, in, into buildings. And, you know, that's increasingly happening. I put this slide in, and some people in the room will recognize this. This was one of the original competition slides that we put in there. And it, it's really in there to tell you that there were a number of strategies that we were employing. So as I said, some of them are passive and some of them are active. But it's a combination of all those things that was going to get us down to the, the holy grail of the net zero energy. We also gave ourselves another set of rules. And this is kind of like, this is kind of developed into an approach that uh, my colleague Roger Frechette, the ME, uh, director of the MEP group in, in Chicago, it's an approach that, it's a four-pronged approach that we have when we're trying to testing ideas and, and, and the process by which we start to put the systems in the building. And that's, I'm going to go through each one quickly. Reduction, as the name would imply, is, is actually just using technologies that uh, are more energy efficient. I mean, it's, it's, it's no more sophisticated than that, really. One of the key planks that we're using uh, as, as a way to, to get a more energy efficient building is actually the use of water for cooling rather than relying on air to cool the building, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Reclamation. So when we've got these energy streams in the building, whatever they may be, is how can we kind of wring every last drop of energy or benefit out of it and actually reuse it, recycle it, use it as preheat or whatever, so that we can not just be cooling or warming fresh air intake. So um, 
Step three, which is, I've got some slides, uh, is obviously some of the issues that we've been talking about during the conference is some of the passive measures, uh, wind turbines, which uh, uh, I'm sure I'll have questions after about costs. So it's probably better to deal with that there than, than uh, we'll talk about it then. Um, and also, we, we have actually got integrated photovoltaics, and we've also looked at geo, geothermal cooling. And this is where one of, uh, one of these things actually falls off the list, because it wasn't actually practical for us to, to use geothermal cooling. The water temperatures around the site were actually too warm for it to be any benefit. So certain things survive the process, other things less so. So um, I will, we'll talk about costs too. Micro turbines. This is kind of really the holy grail for, um, well, maybe less so individual buildings, but also kind of looking at um, district-wide heating and cooling. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but to have a hundred watt uh, bulb in your uh, or lamp in your in your home uh, actually takes a thousand watts of energy from the power station to the switch. So there's massive, massive loss of reduction in terms of energy just consumed from the coal-fired power station to you flicking the switch. So we have to find alternative other methods by which we can be more efficient. And one way of doing this is, um, is introducing micro turbines. That could be on a district basis, it could be on a building basis. In, in uh, Pearl River Tower, it didn't that actually make sense to, um, from, from the size of a building to effectively have a, a gas-fired um, um, energy source through the micro turbines and you know you may say well you're still relying on a fossil fuel but you know that that energy stream is actually 80 percent so uh, more efficient so whether you're looking at 10 to 30 percent from the light bulb you're now up to 80 percent so there are still some losses but um, they're less much much less this just gives you for you those of you who don't know uh, Guangzhou is uh, about an hour and a half drive from Hong Kong and uh, it has a population, someone's fiddled with, the it doesn't have a population of 1.3 billion. It actually has a population, it's bigger than London. So it may be a city you've heard of or not, but uh, it's actually a city of the size of London. This is what Guangzhou looks like, or part of it at least. This is our site. Uh, it's to the east of the main downtown area, and you can see the Pearl River Tower, a uh, Pearl River, I beg your pardon, at the, at the base of the slide. The climate is subtropical, um, so that's a challenge too in terms of what systems one might use and employ. Um, but one of the key planks, and I've, I've alluded to it twice already, is that there's certain things that, we're, that are just no-brainers, really. Um, building siting is a key issue. Uh, we're obviously quite close to uh, the equator there, or much closer than we are in uh, northern Europe or, or, or America. So, you know, the sun is actually passing fairly high over the building during the summer months, so that, that's a factor. One of the key, key drivers was that uh, on our particular site, and because the building is the height it is, and because it's adjacent to a huge area of open space, um, we can take advantage of prevailing winds from the south that occur 10 and a half months of the year. Curiously, for the other month, month and a half, they're actually coming directly from the north, so we have very, very little uh, prevailing east or westerly winds, and that again had a significant um, bearing on how we sited the building and actually started to get us to think about how we might harness that free energy source. But what we did to try and measure it, we, um, the MEP group in Chicago did a, a base building. Um, they modeled something that was 2.2 million square feet, 71 stories tall, uh, 310 meters high, and produced an energy model for that that was a code compliant, Chinese code compliant building. And uh, another little uh, interesting fact is that the Chinese code is actually more stringent than NASHRAE. So, um, and more, <laughs> we were talking about figures, I can't remember, maybe me and Adrian said, what do these things mean? And I think uh, um, we also kind of couldn't really quantify what, what these numbers mean. But, what they estimated was over the lifetime of the building, it would consume 21 billion, nearly, yeah, nearly 21 billion pounds of CO2 over its lifetime. Now, that, that, just hold that figure in your head for a while, because we're going to come back to that. But 
touching on the kind of um, orientation and also trying to uh, use technologies that are performance-based rather than for architectural effect per se, um, and we do have building integrated uh, photovoltaics on the building, but uh, which actually don't really make any sense financially in terms of a payback, but we'll touch up on that as well a bit later. But having said that, the client was getting a grant from the Chinese government, so it's kind of interesting the dialogue that you get into with people in terms of what they really want to do and uh, what's important to them. And it's not really always about payback in, in certain instances. But you can see that this, this solar radiation um, image started to inform us about where the most cost-effective places to put the um, photovoltaics might be. Um, we'll get on to talk about the facade design in a little, in a little while, but uh, we've actually got two different systems. We've got a, a double wall, which are at the risk of talking jargon again, um, I'll talk about in a moment. But what, what, we've, what you can see from the image on the right is that we're trying to locate the photovoltaics uh, in an area that um, are receiving a lot of solar, solar gains. And uh, it's also an area that's adjacent to uh, a plant room. So we're not actually uh, curbing anybody's view or aspect out of that occupied area. The other area that we're looking at is the east and west elevations have a kind of external brucellae condition rather than a double wall. And what we're looking at is putting the PVs in the leading edge of the, um, of, of the louvers. We've heard a lot about natural light. I think the Viricon presentation kind of, again, alluded to some of these things. And, you know, it's a tricky balance about harvesting daylight to be less reliant on, you know, electric light or artificial light and that 40% that we've already looked at, because there's obviously the trade-off between trying to get as much natural light in and also kind of the energy that's needed to combat those kind of solar gains. So that's a, an ongoing battle that we kind of wrestle with. And that's a very, very early image of uh, the competition, but you can see the aspiration whereby we're using, and I'll talk about it in a bit more detail, a, a high-performance double wall on the outside, uh, to try and deal with some of the glare issues and solar issues whilst trying to maintain natural light throughout the space. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the wind because we, we've already um, talked about it earlier in the conference and uh, wind is another one of those things that doesn't really actually have a great payback. Um, what we've developed at SOM in, in Chicago is an approach that's called light green, medium green and dark green. The light green is measures that you would do that are just good design practice and that uh, you know, any building you get from SOM in Chicago would have these strategies and you as a client wouldn't know it. And you would also have the ability to get lead certification if that was something you wanted to pursue. We have medium green, which is starting to look at some of these technologies that, yeah, you're gonna pay a little bit more money to, to, to have them, but they have a reasonable payback. And then you get into the uh, dark green. Um, and you'd have to be a slightly more philanthropic in terms of investing in these things because they don't necessarily represent a good payback, but um, you know, there are sometimes other reasons why people want to do these things. And wind turbines fall into that and to the same extent sort of photovoltaics. But they're also the most visible symbols of a green building which at one level is fairly superficial, but at another level, I think if it starts to engage and develop the technologies and the other technologies that we're not even using yet, I think that at some level that's a valid argument. Now going back to the shape of the building and the siting of the building, um, you'll all be aware that wind speeds at the grade level are obviously not as high as wind speeds at the top of a building, particularly one that's 310 meters high. So. Um, Really, the, when you start building tall, there are some opportunities that kind of start to uh, offer themselves up. Uh, not least the fact that we've got prevailing southerly winds kind of hitting the face of the building. So what was decided fairly early on is that we would try and develop, develop the form and shape of the building that could, could capitalize on that. The other quite interesting thing about wind that I didn't know three years ago is um, that it's got some interesting uh, characteristics as it goes, uh, 
up the building in the sense that uh, we, we've actually placed the wind turbines that are uh, uh, a third of the way up and two thirds of the way up because at one level it makes most sense to put them at the very top of the building where, they, where the wind speeds are, are, are highest. But actually the shape and form of the building is such that what we've done, oh, wrong slide, I've actually gone out of sequence here. The, the building is curved and it's brought two broad faces and what happens is there's a negative energy on the north face or the leeward side that builds up and the approaching wind effectively, get, sorry, effectively gets sucked through those apertures because of this negative effect that happens with the wind patterns. Um, the sides are relatively short, they're very sharp, so all the vortex shedding that we were talking about yesterday and, and earlier, we have no real issues with that at all. And the fact that the shape of the building uh, in, terms of, in its plan form has actually, it's taken a while to get to the kind of ultimate refinement and the, the shape of the apertures is actually meant that even relatively benign winds, two, three meters a second, because of this effect of the, the, the suction through the, the apertures, that's a function of its cube root. So even a two meter per second wind is actually eight meters a second going through the wind turbine. So you can see very quickly, and that's what really that diagram is trying to represent, is you can get some fairly serious wind speeds from some fairly benign winds. And we, we, you know, winds of four meters a second can go up to 64 meters a second. So, um, and what I thought I'd show you is um, the reason that we place the, the wind turbines where we are, not on the roof, is partly because we're benefiting from this uh, performance of the building through its building shape, which we wouldn't get at the top of the buildings. We would just be relying on the approaching wind speed. So we wouldn't get that cube root function. But also they're adjacent to where the mechanical plant rooms are. So we work with RWDI extensively on this and we put it through the wind tunnel test. This is actually the approaching wind speeds when you spin the, wind, uh, the model through the wind tunnel through 360 degrees. This is actually the wind at the upper level that actually you actually generate in harness. So you can see you're capitalizing quite well on that approaching wind. And that wind is then, what represents the blue is actually the wind energy that we get through the turbine. Now, as you'd expect, because the wind speeds are lower at 100 meters rather than they are at 200 meters, the approaching wind is, is not that great. Um, but what we were surprised to see is that the performance of that, although not as great as the upper wind turbines, actually performs pretty well. This is, this, this is actually a, um, a little video of it doesn't work today, so uh, don't worry about it. It's not crucial, but this is starting to show you the kind of wind pressures. And this little animation is actually trying to highlight how the wind actually picks up that, that negative pressure that's actually sucking the wind through. You'll see the little bits of orange and yellow, whereas the approaching wind is actually light blue and dark blue. Um, these are some of the wind turbines that we were actually looking at. We were actually, we're, this is a vertical axis wind turbine. Uh, the building in Bahrain is the horizontal type. The horizontal type only works when the wind is approaching in a particular direction. Uh, whereas the vertical axis actually can take advantage of some kind of deviation of that. So in our case, it was deemed a much more efficient uh, way to do it. We did look at using the kind of aerofoil type turbine, but we've actually settled for the kind of plate metal because of its performance. And this is really what we're trying to achieve, really. We're trying to harness that wind, generate some additional energy that we can use elsewhere in the building. You're familiar with this. We've had several presentations that have shown you wind uh, models. Um, we had hoped to use micro turbines. That I uh, spoke about them a little earlier. They have the ability to be the energy source rather than the cold. Oh, I'll speed up. I got f Is that five minutes? Does that mean five minutes or does that mean get off? Okay, um, so <laughs> um, we wanted to use wind, uh, the micro turbines because uh, we didn't really want to rely on the electricity grid, but unfortunately at Guangzhou and China generally, they're relying on these 400 new coal-fired power stations for too much longer. Uh, we haven't really talked about occupancy comfort, and I'm going to have to skip through some of these slides because uh, I think I'm more than five minutes away. But uh, that's what we're trying to avoid. That's what we're trying to create. So 
less dependent on artificial light. You can see some of the, uh, the technologies here. There's a radiant chilled ceiling. This is a mock-up of the radiant chilled ceiling. Um, all these things are working together. The radiant chilled ceiling, the double wall, and the floor-fed ventilation are all working together. Now, that's very, very important in terms of persuading clients to start investing in these technologies, which do have a, a premium attached to them. What we're trying to do is control that kind of solar glare at the, at the facade and try and create an even temperature throughout the, the, the whole of the occupied area. And those things in combination, the facade system, which we haven't even talked about yet, uh, the chilled radiant ceiling, which are, um, it, it's chilled water. Uh, we're relying on chilled water to do the cooling rather than air. It's a very, very ineffective way to cool a building using an air system. So a uh, water-based system gives us all sorts of advantages. So that combination of all these things working together, and they are working together, oh, gives us that even temperature spread over the, um, the whole occupied area. Um, it's a double wall system. I'm not going to dwell too much on this, except to say that it's, uh, it's a high-performance, low-E coated double glaze system on the outside. We've got a 200 cavity with a blind in there, uh, which is uh, fully retractable. It's down all the time. It's horizontal most of the time, and it is operated by a photocell, so whatever sun angle is out there, the blind will adjust. There, there was a comment earlier that someone said it's a shame that the blinds are on down when the, when the sun's out. Well, we kind of need it to stop glare and stop the building heating up. But these are perforated blinds, so even fully shut, you can still see the skyline of Guangzhou and beyond, so it's not really any encumbrance on the building. So, But that's operated by a photocell that's located at the top of the building, so it's tracking the sun angle. They're fully automated. We can have a manual override, which we're trying to discourage because the Chinese like to play with equipment. Um, I won't go through this because I haven't really got time, but our real problem area is actually not in July or August, it's in November when we get the low sun angles in the summer, uh, in the winter, sorry. One of the things we're very nervous about, uh, whether it be any building, but Guangzhou is a, a very hot, humid uh, climate, uh, so the ability of the high-performance skin to resist any air movements, either in or out, um, is, is kind of crucial, especially when we're using a, a chilled radiant ceiling system whereby there's a risk of condensation. We've got a number of methods of how we're going to overcome that. That may be a question I get in the questions. Um, but also being a tall building, we have to be very, very mindful of the, the stack effect that affects tall buildings such as this. So, uh, you know, in the summer condition where the outside, outside air is warmer than the, the, the conditioned air in the, in the building, that conditioned air is dropping and that's forcing uh, or the, the air at the high level of the building wants to try and come into the building. So it's very, very important that we have a, a high-performing facade. Obviously, the, the reverse is true in the winter. Now, path to zero energy. We've got all these strategies, and I, because I had to cut it down to 25 minutes, I haven't been able to go through all of them. But you'll, you'll recall these four st stages of reduction, reclamation, absorption, and generation. Well, we couldn't do the last two just because of the reasons I've outlined. What that has actually meant is that horrific figure of 21 billion is now down to a more respectable 9 billion. It's, it sounds like a lot, but it, it does represent a 58% reduction, and that's employing all those measures. Now, how do we persuade a client, someone else I think asked that earlier, to part with all this cash to, to do these systems? Because there's no doubt that there, there is a premium attached to some of them. So what we showed him in, in terms of how we were going to approach and try and justify doing some of these things is, you know, you start looking, and I'm sorry, it's in kilowatt hours. Um, um, it's just the way it comes up, I'm afraid. Um, but you can see our cooling loads, our pump loads, because we've got, we're only supplying fresh air through the floor. It's makeup air. It's not cooling the building. So that represents about a fifth of the amount of air that we'd have to put in a building uh, as opposed to it's all our counterparts. So all the... Um, all the air handling units uh, they are much, much smaller, so there's efficiencies there. Now, because we've got this very good sandwich of using chilled water rather than big air ducts to supply the cooling, what that's meant is our floor-to-floor -floor levels are 3.9 meters, or 13 feet uh, in Imperial. Now, when you're building a 71-story tall building, that represents a big volume that you don't otherwise have to build and still maintain the same occupiable area and, and, and rental value. 
Now, our client had permission for 310 metres, so there was no way that he was not building that. But what that also allowed him to do was actually put in five floors that he wouldn't have otherwise got if we hadn't employed this combination of systems. It also meant, and we benchmarked this against our, our, our own cores on other um, similar type buildings, is that because we're using uh, water vertically to distribute the cooling primarily, they're much, much smaller than air ducts. And that actually translates into an 8% more efficient core, if you like, or it gives you more net lettable back. So when you add all these things together, the, you know, you're obviously not paying as much in your utility bills. The fact that we managed to get these, uh, uh, these, these additional floors and the fact that we have a more effective uh, ratio of uh, net to gross meant that he could get his money back in five years, or less than five years. Uh, and just to show you or persuade you that it is real, these are some shots that I took and, uh, uh, a month or so ago, and uh, that's the slides on the right are actually the visual mock-up. They're not the prototype. But we have since tested it, and it appears that it's looking good. And actually, these are shots from Roger Frechette that uh, I got yesterday. So this is the building as of yesterday. So you can start to see the kind of characteristics of the building, the shape taking form, even if, even if it's skeletal in nature, it's actually starting to kind of take on board some of the characteristics that we hoped it would. I popped this one in there because this was actually one of the founding partners who uh, mentioned this 42 or 40 years ago, and uh, I think it's probably more appropriate now than it was then. That's my presentation.